Welcome, Pewter Report readers, viewers, and listeners to a brand new edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius, the official energy drink of PewterReport.com, and the Pewter Report podcast. Hello to all the Pewter people that are just filing into the chats. We got a very exciting show coming up today as we do the other side of the football with this Bucks all defensive mock draft. If you watched yesterday's show, we did all offense. But today, we're talking about the side that wins championships. That's right. Even in today's offensive age, defense still wins championships. So we are doing a fun little hypothetical of what if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers drafted all players on defense this year and added them to their team. We know Todd Bowles would absolutely love it. I don't know about the rest of the organization. <laughs> anyway, let's get to it. I'm your host, Matt Matera. Joined with me is the face that runs the place at PeterReport.com and the constructor of this all-defensive mock draft, SR Scott Reynolds. Scott, how are we doing? Doing good. It's a great day to talk defense, Matt. One, yes, of, my, one of my favorite parts of football, probably the favorite part of football. Um, so it, it's, it was a fun exercise yesterday. Had some great questions and participation from the pewter reporter uh, uh, crowd out there, the pewter people. And, um, and we're going to tackle the defensive side today. Tackle meaning um, now let's, let's get to it. We have some news though on the defensive side of the ball. Speaking of, of Bucks defense, uh, Warren Sapp, friend of the program, yeah. longtime uh, Buccaneer, great hall of famer has joined the coaching staff of uh, Deion Sanders out in Colorado. So joining the big 12, hopefully he'll be kind to my Kansas state Wildcats. But uh, Warren Sapp will be a uh, like a quality control coach out there, like a, a GA coach. He is enrolled in classes out there in Colorado, which allows him to be on the staff. And he's going to be working with surprise, 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 the uh, defensive line. Sorry, I watched that <laughs> reel way too many times <laughs> on Instagram. But uh, yeah, so congrats to, to Warren and the Colorado Buffaloes. I think their pass rush is going to get a little bit better. And uh, the Bucks' pass rush needs to get a little bit better too, Matthew. Yeah, very much so. But, yeah, um, very cool to see Warren Sapp get this uh, role with Colorado. He obviously has a friendship and relationship with, with Deion Sanders. He um, has been out to Colorado before, <laughs> assisting in one way or another. Uh, great comment by Kieran who says, he went to Colorado? Guess he must have taken the advice from a Muni Financial. We will be talking about a Muni Financial yeah. Uh, a little bit later on the show, but great comment. But yeah, I mean, one thing I've always appreciated about Warren is that he's really given back to the game since he retired from playing football. Yeah. He's been at several Bucks practices, like more OTAs and things of yeah. that nature. But I remember when Logan Hall got drafted and mm -hmm. he was right there helping out Logan Hall. He's helped out other draft picks, uh, went to the commanders for a couple of practices yeah. and helped out there. So Kansas City Chiefs with his yeah, the, uh, the Chiefs as well. So, uh, 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 Joe Cullen, defensive yeah. line coach, former the helped former them, Buccaneer uh, defensive yeah. line coach, helped yeah. them out too. So, yeah. yeah, the point I'm trying to make is that it'll be even better to see him in a more sustainable role throughout the entire season. And obviously, everybody's going to be watching Colorado. Everyone did last year, and quite frankly, they weren't really a good football team. They they yeah. were not ball eligible. They obviously have Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter, but the defense was a big reason why that. They struggled uh, yeah. last season, so hopefully no Warren Sapp can can really uh, put a big help in this. And yes, as you finish your uh, your statement, Scott, the pass rush and particularly the four man pass rush, mm -hmm. I think, will be a big indicator for how the Bucks twenty twenty four season goes, at least on the defensive side of the football. Yeah, because we've seen how this defense can look when they are getting pressure, mm -hmm. especially off of the edge, and we've seen what this defense looks like when they have to generate their own pressure in separate ways um, via the blitz when um, when they can't get home with the front yeah. four. So uh, we'll be very telling. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, the exercise we did here, very much like we did on Monday's show, which is all offense, this is all defense. And sometimes you don't always get what you want, right? So, uh, like, we – we're trying to be as realistic as possible, not play fantasy football here and give the Buccaneers every single dream pick. Correct. And in this mock draft, we take in this into some considerations like we did yesterday. We said Jackson Powers Johnson is off the board 
And we, we said that uh, Graham Barton's off the board. Uh, so at 26, the Buccaneers take Keon Coleman, right, from Florida State. Yeah. Same kind of premise here. Uh, I think that the, the top edge rushers, obviously Dallas Turner from Alabama, is going to be gone, long gone, probably top 10, probably number eight to Atlanta. That's where a lot of mock drafts have him going. Seems like a Raheem Morris kind of guy. But when you look at Jared Verse, I don't see him making it to 26. Uh, I would be surprised if Liatu Latu from UCLA also yeah. made it to 26. So those guys off the board. And so we're trying to keep this as realistic as possible. And maybe this is kind of like an unfavorable situation for the Buccaneers. Cooper uh, DeGene from uh, Iowa, the cornerback slash safety, he's also off the board. Those are some some um, some processes I went through and, and trying to make this as realistic as possible. So if you have to stick and pick, who would be a, a fit for Tampa Bay? And – Let's just dive right into it. Uh, we'll get to Adam Hamilton's uh, super chat here in just one second, but uh, the, the let's start the show with with the first pick, and we'll throw up the uh, the overall board right there, and it starts with Nate Wiggins from Clemson. And the reason why we we went with Clemson's Nate Wiggins is the size is a bit of a concern in terms of the the weight, 173 pounds. Right, he's very skinny, very thin. But he's highly competitive. I think if you saw him chase down Amarion Hampton, the running back yes. from North Carolina, 60 yards downfield and punch the ball out a la Antoine Winfield Jr. at the goal line to save a touchdown and, and Clemson's win over North Carolina, um, that's a pretty good indicator of this kid's competitiveness. It's also mm-hmm. an indicator of his speed, Matt. And if you're not going to be a big guy, well, you better be a fast guy and a long guy. And he's just under 6'2". It's pretty decent length for an outside cornerback in Todd Bowles' system. Only has three interceptions, but guess what? Two of those were pick sixes, yep. including one against FAU. And two of those interceptions, including one that went, I want to say, like 90 yards in yeah. 2022 against Drake May. He also picked off Drake May this year as well. So he makes those interceptions count when he gets them. And this might be a situation where you look at the speed, the athleticism. He got a really good uh, RAS, relative athletic score. And you say, let's hit the weight program. Let's hit the protein shakes, get you up to 180, 185, fill you out a little bit. Um, and, and you know what? With Jamel Dean and with Zion McCollum, you don't have to start this guy right away, man. Yeah, he may not have all the turnovers that is necessarily desired in this Buccaneer specific secondary that is craving for their cornerbacks to take the ball away. However, not every highlight tape is created equal. And yeah, uh, well when when Nate Wiggins makes a play, it is up front and center. I mean, a long, long pick six off of Drake May. I believe it was in the ACC championship game as well. Uh, to take it back to the house, um, another pick six and a four two eight speed. Yeah. I mean, that is splashy. That is very, very splashy. And that's not an indicator of a, like every single player and how important that should be. But I, I think in this situation, especially at cornerback, everyone should take note of what he was able to do. You mentioned the the track down play um, by Wiggins as well. So he shows up in in very – very big moments. I mean, Drake may could be the second QB off the board in this year's draft. Yeah. And Wiggins can kind of say that he has his number a little bit. Um, I like this pick as well for what you were talking about too. The Bucks got to find, because first round pick, you obviously want the guy to play right away, which you think corn and you're like, ah, well, you know, they just signed Bryce Hall. Zion McCollum's going to be a starter. Now you got your Mel Dean. Yeah. But I also like the idea of, setting yourself up for the future. This is kind of like yeah. what we talked about with Keon Coleman as the first That's pick right. next year of Jamel Dean. I don't want to say he's on the hot seat. I know we talk about no, coaches he's, being he's on, the on the hot seat. seat. No, All right, he is. fine. He's fine. We're saying seat. it. We're planting our He's oft right injured, now. doesn't pick off passes. Reminds you of Carlton Davis, right? April, what happened to Carlton yes. Davis? Yeah. April 2nd, 2024 at 411, we are declaring as a podcast that Jamel Dean is on the hot seat. And if yeah. he doesn't perform this season, he is going to be – a trade candidate or a, a cap casualty yeah. like Carlton Davis was that Carlton Davis got traded, right. but if he didn't get traded, who knows? Uh, odds are he probably ends up um, getting let go and the bucks are still in the same type of situation. 
this is a good spot for Wiggins where, you know, he can compete to be the starter. If you're a first round pick, you're competing to be the starter at yep. really at any position, unless right. like Tom Brady's there or Jerry Rice or something like that, or Mike Evans. Um, <laughs> but so you, you look at that cornerback room and it's filled up pretty well this year already with Dean. But as we said, he gets injured all the time and yeah. that makes a big difference with Zion, Bryce Hall, Thomas, who's going to play a lot of the uh, probably nickel type of situation. But as soon as one injury happens, and let's face it, Jamel Dean, we're kind of almost expecting at this point. Yeah. One injury and Nate Wiggins becomes a very, very important piece to the puzzle. And you want to have a guy that's ready. You want to have a guy that has that athleticism. Yeah. And Todd Bowles probably loves length more than anything else in his uh, yeah. in his secondary and corner specifically. Right. So you got a guy that's right in the wheelhouse of Todd Bowles. Um, I think it's a good pick if some of the other guys that we've talked about on the show and that we've written about aren't available. So yeah. uh, I'm with it with Nate Wiggins. Yeah, and Prickell's asked, why not Rake Straw, the Missouri cornerback, or Lasseter from Georgia? I think Lasseter is a good player. Don't know if he's first-round caliber. Rake Straw is kind of a fringe first, second-round guy, but smaller guy, 5'11", 183. So um, he doesn't have that size. Uh, I I've been told multiple times, don't look for the Buccaneers to draft a uh, a cornerback under six feet tall again after after Vernon Hargraves. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just not a Todd Bowles corner, and that eliminates some guys like Kool Aid McKinstry, who's a very good man to man corner, but just doesn't have the size that Bowles is looking for, the long arms and et cetera. So um, that's why Adam Hamilton here with the 1999 super chat, Matt. Thank you so much, Adam. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, Adam. Good to hear from you again. He says, hi, guys. Been gone for a little bit. That's all right. Welcome welcome back. Uh, still listen after. Matt, I got to know, this guy is a great prospect, and I hope we draft him. <laughs> but do you just love saying the name Malachi Corley? Malachi uh, Corley. Sounds yeah. like greatness. Yeah, he does. Go Bucks. First of all, again, thank you for the Super Chat, and that's yeah. the beauty of the Super Chat. If you are going to Super Chat us, Today's a defensive podcast, but we're happy yep. to talk about offense if That's you right. want to talk about offense. You make we the rules. Of, yeah, you make the rules. We get a ton of comments, and we love that, but we can't get into every single one. So you super chat us, you cut the line, and we make sure that we get to it. Yep. Malachi Corley, I do love saying his name, and I didn't necessarily realize that until you're bringing up Adam Hamilton. I think it's the alliteration. My name is alliteration, um, and I don't know. The, the way that the back end of the C – and the beginning of the C in Corley, the back end of the C in Malachi, yeah. and the beginning of the C in Corley, I like the way that hits, kind of like the way that the end of the T in Matt and the T in Matera yeah. hits at the end of uh, my last name. So, I don't know, maybe uh, subconsciously I've just always enjoyed that. But to uh, go further, yeah, Malachi Corley is an excellent fit in this Buccaneers offense. We talked about it a lot on yesterday's show, but happy to uh, kind of give a synopsis today. We saw him at the Senior Bowl. Scott had a great conversation with him at the Senior Bowl as well. He brings that um, Amon Ra St. Brown type Mm -hmm. of vibe, type of feel. He can play in the slot, and he is the king of the yak, as Scott uh, perfectly said on yesterday's show. He will make you miss. It's just a matter of getting the ball in his hands, and he will be effective, as I said yesterday, either 20 yards down the field, five yards down the field, or Mm -hmm. two yards behind the line of scrimmage. He can just do a number of great things that the Bucs don't have in this offense right now, Mm -hmm. as good as it can be. No, I I think it's well said. And, and uh, his name too, kind of reminds me of Yaya Diaby, Malachi Corley. Yeah. It's very cool. (laughs) Very cool sounding name and and cool dude too. Really had a great conversation with him in the senior bowl and he's legit. He was our second round pick for the Bucs after drafting Keon Coleman in our all offensive first round mock draft or i should say mock draft in the first round yesterday and malachi corley uh, probably a chris godwin replacement type player is uh is uh is the selection there in second round so speaking of the second round let's get to it i know y'all want a pass rusher and we got one for you but maybe a little controversial we know how the bucks love senior bowl players and we probably should have mentioned malachi corley yes um and and a host of of the players uh that we we mentioned uh, Tanner uh, Bortolini. Uh, I'm trying to think of who who was in our mock yesterday that also was at the Senior Bowl. Um, 
and then Milton wasn't Juwan Jordan. There was two or three guys from yeah. that draft that were in the senior bowl. In this case, Marshawn Neeland, our second round pick from Western Michigan, who played defensive end, but he'll be an outside linebacker. Did a lot of standing up. Interesting yes. usage. They stood him up as as a as, as a rusher, kind of like how Joe Tryon Shoinka stood up for uh, Todd Bowles, or how you would see Devin White threaten the A gap as a stand up blitzer. That's how they used him. They also used him as a as a hand in the dirt kind of guy, as a four three defensive end. Uh, the Bucks run a four man front as well. But the thing that I I love and the Buccaneers love about Marshawn Neeland and Josh Capo and Matt Patera and Adam Slavon <laughs> and Bailey Adams love about this guy. The physical presence, just the physicality of this guy. He is, I think Trevor Sikkim has said it best. It's like watching a car crash with this guy. I mean, he is violent. He is physical. And he reminds me, because I'm old enough to remember when Cameron Jordan came out of Cal back in the day. And I remember watching him at the Senior Bowl thinking, oh, this Cam Jordan, he's hell on wheels, you know. And he goes to the Saints. And he gets a whole bunch of sex and Pro Bowls and all that. But he didn't have a Super Bowl. Sorry, Cam. No. Um, but the thing about Marshawn Neeland that's interesting is there are some real parallels between Marshawn Neeland, who did not have a bunch of sacks at, um, at Western Michigan. Matter of fact, it, it's a little scary how few sacks that he had. And I'm a big kind of production guy. Um, but he's a very good athletic tester, 4.75 in the 40-yard yeah. dash. A uh, very good athlete in terms of, of explosion and all of that. He did have 12 sacks, which includes four and a half in 2021, as well as 2023. You know, 12 sacks, not a whole bunch. Cam Jordan only had 16 sacks in his career, and his career high was six. Yet, Cam Jordan became a better pro and eight-time Pro Bowler, as I mentioned. had He had six seasons in the NFL in New Orleans out of those 13 with double-digit sacks. So I think this guy can become that player. Um, he's He's got a pretty good arsenal when it comes to, to pass rush. And so I think that that's that's kind of the saving grace with this guy. He's got the tools. Sometimes the sacks don't always fall your way. He's a faster, more athletic version of Cam Jordan, just about 15, 20 pounds lighter. Jordan is, is just a massive 285 uh, 290 pound guy. This guy's about 270, 275. Uh, think Yaya Diaby in terms of size, maybe not as cut and muscular, not as fast, but very physical player. And and remember, it's not just the pass rush, the the speed off the edge that you need to replace yes. with Shaq Barrett, Matt. It's the ability to set the edge in the run game. Yes. One of Shaq Barrett's most underrated traits, tremendous against the run. And Joe Tryon Schwink has made some strides. Anthony Nelson is an okay run defender. Marshawn Neeland is a tremendous run defender. And I think Todd Bowles will value that as this guy's pass rush comes along. The Bucs had a tough enough time defending the run inside the middle. And they're still a better run-stopping team than most in the league. If they start allowing the outside edge, it's it's over <laughs> for, yeah. uh, for their run-stopping defense. I like the speed with Nealon too. You mentioned his uh, forty time of four seven five. Um, not too shabby um, yeah. in that department as an edge rusher. It's funny because Yaya Diaby, while built like an alien, kind of with his yeah. <laughs> with his stature, I still wouldn't even describe as like the craziest physical type of football player when he is on the field. And he got right. the job done. He had seven and a half sacks last year in a limited amount of playing time until he became the starter. So, yeah. you know, there's more than one way to be a productive football player um, in the NFL. But Neyland, I think, can kind of bring that little bit of smash mouth that maybe has been missing since JPP was last with the Buccaneers. Because yeah. uh, Shaq was never known as, like, a physical dominating edge rusher. It was always, hey, he's going to win with his speed and – Really, with this timing, I mean, we saw how many times Shaq went off sides in his career with the right. Bucs trying to time that snap count. So I think it's good to have a little bit of a different player than uh, necessarily Yaya Diaby being out on one of the edges. It's clear that outside linebacker is a really, really important position for the Bucs to figure out this year because they yeah. want to use Joe Tryon-Shanka in that 
Joker type of package where they can just kind of line them up everywhere, maybe Mm -hmm. line them up at linebacker for a play and then on the inside a little bit. So it's important to really solidify that outside linebacker spot because if they do, JTS is on the last year of his deal. Anthony Nelson is on the last year of his deal. But after that, you got Yaya Diaby for -hmm. two more seasons. Let's just say Nealon works out. You got two young outside linebackers as the future cornerstones of this Bucks team. Yeah. Not to mention Jose Ramirez and Marquise Watts, who will get another year of development. Um, <laughs> funny that the tight end room for the Bucks is so young, and we talked about how young that group is. Yeah. The outside linebackers playing at the exact same spots just for the defense and not the offense. It would kind of right. be in that same situation. But Nealon, the uh, speed and the athleticism – are exciting. I know Bucks fans don't like Cam Jordan, but I think we all have to admit Cam Jordan oh, in his you'd prime. You'd like him if he is, was a red and pewter. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Cam <laughs> he Jordan had a 13 in his year prime, career in red and pewter. Player. Yeah. You'd like him for sure. It's a good comparison to have. It doesn't always pan out that way. And, you know, stats are important, but they're not every single thing. So hopefully yeah. he can kind of um, defy those odds in, in that sense. But Nealon, he was in our mock draft um, when Adam Slavon and myself did the live mock draft on. Yeah on PFF. So a uh, hot commodity in, in Tampa Bay. I've seen him pop up in a lot of mock drafts um, around the NFL league. Yeah, exactly. Now the thing is, is, is uh, um, there, there's a report today and we'll have this in the tracker in a little bit. Uh, Byron Murphy yeah. from Texas, the defensive tackle is, um, is coming in for a top 30 visit. And I, I like him. I don't think he's going to be there at 26. I think this is a situation where the Buccaneers um, are doing some of their due diligence in case he slides that they do a little bit of, of recon on him just to see, but uh, I like Murphy a lot. And I, I see the, the value in drafting a defensive tackle this year, Murphy six, one, three Oh eight. Uh, PFF had him as the second best pass. Or I should say second best defensive tackle overall. He does have some serious pass rush game. This guy had six sacks last year at Texas, 36 hurries. And while Tavondre Sweat got the Defensive Player of the Year award mm-hmm. in the Big 12, and with good reason. He's more the Vita Vea. This guy is more like the Kalaja Kansi. And we talk about Jamel Dean being on the hot seat. Another guy on the hot seat is, is Logan Hall. And yes. we've seen how quickly Jason Light will get rid of mistakes. And Logan Hall has a very short window of time to get him out of the mistake column and into the worthy draft pick column. Not not even so much the I'm worth the second overall, or I should say that the second pick, the Bucks first overall pick in the 2020 draft, uh, 2022 draft. I don't know that he has to do that this year, but he's got to show he's a worthy pick. And right now, um, we saw Jason Light in one draft last year, draft Kalaja Kansi to replace essentially Logan Hall. That's what happened. I mean, he, yeah. he was the guy in those nickel rush packages next to Vita Vea, not Logan Hall. So uh, I do think they're going to draft a defensive tackle this year. And if Byron Murphy is there at 26 and he is the best player available, I'm all for it. You've got to fortify your, your trenches, getting another upper echelon player. Vita Vea is not going to play forever. I mean, he's 29 already time flies. Yeah. But, uh, in the third round, we're going to go with a defensive tackle. Aruk Aurororo. And that sounds like I just was on Scooby-Doo for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but Aurororo. Yeah, Aurororo. Yeah, Aruk Aurororo. He is. Aurororo. Uh, he, he's a. This dude is a dude. I mean, he's he is all business. Um, mm-hmm. Big time uh, athletic uh, defensive tackle. Not the biggest guy, but you can see he's pretty well put together. And the thing I like about him is just the the tenacity he brings. Um, he is a, a very good athlete. Uh, matter of fact, he got a 9-9 on the RAS score. That's higher than Kalaja Kansi. That ranks 17th out of 1,620 defensive tackles in Kent Lee Platt's RAS, which is the RAS score, from 1987 to 2024. Rook Aurora is the 17th most athletic defensive tackle coming out of this draft. And if you thought that that they liked the athleticism of Logan Hall, which they did, they drafted him. If you thought that they liked the athleticism of Kalaja Kansi, they did, they drafted him. 
This guy is more athletic, more explosive. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of him. And you know what? If you're going to get one Clemson Tiger, get another one. They know how to play defense there. And with with the Aurora Hero, uh, four eight nine time in the the forty yard dash, six foot four, two hundred ninety four pounds. He's got a good frame, and the sack production it was starting to come on. So uh, he had eight tackles for loss yes, which is the last two the seasons. One. Lives in the backfield, had a career high five sacks last year, four sacks the previous season. Uh, I, I just like this guy, and and he and it probably it probably is worth mentioning, Matt. We didn't mention this already. Wiggins was a formal interview at the combine. Marshawn Nealon was a formal interview at the combine, and is taking a top thirty visit. And Rook Aurora also a formal visit with the Bucks at the combine. I am a big fan of your third round picks um, in general in this uh, this defensive mock draft and you bring up logan hall and it's so interesting right because when it comes to drafting athletic defensive linemen i would say the bucks are two for the last three vita vea used to be a running back we don't yeah. bring that up enough <laughs> yeah. um and obviously kalija Cansey shot out like a cannon once he was healthy and and ready to go for the buccaneers so really logan hall was the only one that didn't work and now logan hall it's essentially can he pick up the time that was used by Will Golston when they had Will Golston as like an extra defensive tackle. Um, I really, really, the big thing that stuck out to me for uh, Rook Aurora is uh, the, def- the tackles for loss that yeah. you, that you talked about. I think that is a huge selling point for really any defensive tackle that is making their way into the NFL, even defensive tackles in the NFL yeah. currently, because I think more than any position, defensive tackle, the stats maybe don't – the lack of lack of stats, I should say, maybe don't always tell the story. If Vita right. Bay is taking double teams and triple teams, Vita Bay is not going to get as many sacks. And right. he was the sack leader uh, two years before, yeah. so he's still got the production. But what I'm saying is a lot of the times defensive tackles are able to – open up other things for a blitzing linebacker for an edge rusher to get a Mm -hmm. one-on-one matchup, which they may not typically get. So when you see him get eight tackles for loss um, in the last two seasons, that I think really stands out because Clemson has a good defense, but I mean, he was one of the, the main catalysts for it. The athleticism, Todd Bowles loves athletic players. It does not matter whether you're a safety, which we'll talk about momentarily. It doesn't matter if you're uh, a nose tackle. He wants a guy that he can move around, that can physically move as well. So I love the combination of athleticism, the size. That picture was just so cool. Him uh, folding his arms like that. Like, he means business. He is absolutely ready to go. And I think you said it best. He is absolutely a dude yeah. so like now, he's the type I, of yeah go ahead. I, I was gonna say the, the one thing too to, to answer grace points question here so how would he line up with vea and cancy well the buccaneers do play a fair share of nickel right when they're in nickel yeah. they are in that that four-man front but at the same time what what he gives you is the ability to sub in for a kalaja cancy or vita vea in that four-man front right it keeps a guy like Greg Gaines, who's got some pass rush ability, but yeah. you don't necessarily want him in there on third downs or in obvious passing situations. But, but w- when Vita Vey is tired, right, and he and he needs a breather, what are your options? Your options are Logan Hall, Greg Gaines, and and Mike Green, right? Yeah. If, if Kalijah's in there, and the same thing, if Kalijah needs a breather, th- those are those are your options, right? And we saw Kalijah Cansey miss what the first four or five games of the season yeah, last year. Yeah, pretty much. We've seen Vita Vea miss chunks of the season before. When those guys are gone, now all of a sudden Logan Hall is is up in the starting lineup, and your backup, when Logan Hall needs a breather now, and Vita Vea's sidelined, or Kalaja Kansi sidelined, now you now you have Mike Green next to Kalaja Kansi, right? Or you've got Mike Green, if Kalaja's sidelined, next to Vita Vea, when Logan Hall's on the sideline getting a breather. So it's just you need another good body, and they wanted Logan Hall to be that guy. Remember, when they're not in nickel and they're in base, they're running a 3-4 defensive scheme. That means three down linemen, three defensive yeah. tackles. And you want one of those guys to replace Logan Hall. If he's not going to get bigger, if he's not going to get stronger, if he's not going to get better, 
then that's the guy that you want, you know, in there for the replacement. So, uh, gosh, if this team could go four deep in terms of depth, right, at defensive tackle, I, I think that that they're, you know, look out because this is a guy that can play the run as well as rush the passer. And he's not as as limited like, say, Greg Gaines is where he's mostly a run stopper. So you, you're adding a really versatile guy into the mix. And remember, Will Golston probably not going to be back. He'll be 33 yeah. this year. It's probably done. So th- this is somebody to push Logan Hall either to greatness or to the bench and add another good defensive body in there to safeguard against injury for Kalaja Kansi or Vita Vea as this guy develops. The best defenses in the league have a rotation on the defensive line, and they're not always just relying on one or two guys the way that the Bucs are to a degree with Vita Vea and and Kalijah Kansi. So they do need to find another option. It's great to have options, which the Bucs would love to have, the same way that we, all as civilians, get to have when choosing what we want to have when we are drinking a Celsius energy drink, which, of course is the presenting sponsor of the Pewter Report podcast. Check out the newest line of Celsius drinks. They are the Celsius Essentials. They got awesome flavors like Blue Crush and Dragonberry. These are the tall boys of Celsius energy drinks. They got 270 milligrams of caffeine packed into the can. So if you're looking for a little extra oomph, a little extra push during your day, the Celsius Essentials are perfect for you but don't forget about their original flavors as well could be the peach vibe arctic vibe strawberry lemonade cucumber lime so many great flavors of celsius so you need to know where to find a celsius energy drink whether it's the celsius essentials or the og celsius energy drink go to the store locator on the celsius website punch in your address and it'll tell you the closest geographical location where you could pick one up could be a Walmart, 7-Eleven, health and fitness store, or if you're lucky enough, it could be your bodega. Bodega. And once you keep going to your bodega, I'm just thinking Malachi, Corley, Celsius, bodega. <laughs> but once you keep going to your local bodega and you love Celsius, you want to start getting them in bulk, you can get it in bulk. I'd also recommend getting that variety pack because variety is the spice of life. You can go to Amazon, click on that subscribe and save and have it sent to your place of residence whenever you want. You're in charge. You're the captain. Just make sure you're drinking Celsius energy drinks. Make Celsius your number one pick during this draft season. Celsius, the official energy drink of PeterReport.com. I think you're muted. I am muted. There we go. Well said. Let's uh, let's move on, shall we? Um, let's let's get into the pass rusher, right? More pass rusher are a good thing. Uh, no, not quite yet. Sorry, we're going to get to, uh, but we got another another guy. We're going to hit the secondary. Yes, we're we're going to go with uh, Georgia safety Tyke Smith, one of oh, our yeah. longtime favorites, dating back to the Senior Bowl. I've been watching this guy Georgia the last couple of years. Man, he's so good. Two time national champion. And uh, one of the players, too, that, again, surprise, surprise, the Buccaneers interviewed formally at the Combine, was also a Senior Bowl star. So you're getting that Senior Bowl guy. And uh, big-time playmaker, big-time hitter. This is just a Todd Bowles type of defensive back. He can play in the box. He can play a little free. But mostly he's a nickel, so he can compete with Christian Izian, Tavier uh, Thomas for mm-hmm. some playing time there. He can be a great understudy and rotator for Jordan Whitehead at strong safety. He's a safeguard in case any of those players get injured. Uh, this is a player that's ready to play right now. Five years of football, two at first, first two at West Virginia, last three at Georgia, and love everything about him. He fills up the stat sheet. He is a takeaway guy, uh, big-time hitter, sure tackler, one of my absolute favorite players in this draft. And if they don't draft him, I'm going to be really sad. This is one of the guys that I <laughs> really have that draft crush on four, four, six speed. He's instinctive. He's physical, hard nosed guy. And again, just fills up the stat sheet. He, he's got 212 tackles, 21 and a half tackles for loss, five sacks, 12 pass breakups, two forced fumbles and a defensive touchdown between his days at West Virginia and Georgia. And, you know, he had eight interceptions in college, including four as a senior. He just finds a way to be around the ball. 
Todd Bowles seems to like those guys. He would fit in really well with Jordan Whitehead and Antoine Winfield Jr. in that mix and just gives the Buccaneers some position versatility. He is one of those chess piece guys that I think Todd Bowles, once this guy learns the system, could move around and use. I think he would be a solid pick for for uh, for the Buccaneers. Tyke Smith is well traveled from going from West Virginia to Georgia. And what I love about him the most is what you said about his instincts. And I think that's a trait that in a player in the secondary is something I probably value more most above like other traits. And obviously athleticism and everything is important. But when you look at some of the great safeties like Ed Reed. Troy Palomalu, or a great safety right now in Antoine Winfield Jr. The instincts, being able to anticipate a play, or something like Ed Reed would do, would be faking you know, the quarterback that he's going to go one way right. just to force him to throw the way that he wanted him to. Um, I'm not saying I see Ed Reed and Troy Palomalu in, in Tyke Smith, but the yeah. instincts, just knowing what's going to happen on a play, that I do see, and that I really admire in him in a player. And we want to talk about his fit with the Buccaneers and playing with some of these other guys. He has a blend of both Antoine Winfield Jr. Mm -hmm. and Jordan Whitehead. He, he can be physical. He can make all of the tackles as you just uh, put on display for everybody. He can take the ball away like Antoine Winfield Jr. can. And even Antoine Winfield Jr. hasn't intercepted the football the way that I think everybody would want to. Yeah. He's just punching it out of the quarterback, <laughs> running backs and receivers. Yeah. <laughs> um, all of the time. So I don't want to keep beating a dead horse with, oh, this guy is perfect for Todd Bowles, but Todd mm -hmm. Bowles loves that versatility. He loves athleticism yeah. and versatility. It He's a Georgia play. Bulldog. His son Troy goes exactly. there. Exactly. So he Todd knows Bowles him intimately. Knows He's seen him the last Tyke couple Smith. of years. Yeah. He knows Tyke Smith more Brian than McClendon knows most him, right? coaches were. He was a yeah, Georgia Brian, on the staff Brian last McClendon year. As well. A lot so of connections. It's a, it's, it's a perfect fit. It's a hell of a pick in the third round if, if he still – available when the bucks are on the clock and again luckily they have two third round picks thanks to that carlton davis trade i would love 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 to see tyke smith the former georgia bulldog and west virginia mountaineer but uh, yeah. the former georgia bulldog in red and pewter this year all right let's go to colorado state uh, oklahoma i'm sorry oklahoma colorado state outside linebacker i'm trying to read here mo camara uh, um edge rusher you want more pass rush? We got it right here. This guy um, is is interesting, right? Because, uh, yeah, as Felix said, he would look great in pewter. Kieran Butt says, I feel like Kamara could be a real sleeper pick, but I don't know if he's going to be there in the fourth, let alone the Bucks leaving it till day three before taking such a need. Well, remember, they draft Marshawn Neeland as an outside linebacker. He is a pass rusher. Now, Mo Kamara is another pass rusher. The Buccaneers... Well, they had some luck with another Colorado State Ram, and that was yeah. Shaq Barrett. They didn't draft him, but they got him after he got a little bit better once he was with the Denver Broncos. The thing with Kamara is built very much like Shaq, 6'1", 250 pounds, and very quick, explosive off the edge, quick first step, probably a little stronger, maybe a little stouter than Shaq Barrett. But they have this guy kind of in Marquise Watts. Marquis Watts is a little yeah. bit more jacked up and rocked up, but uh, it wouldn't hurt to to draft another guy with some explosion and first step off the edge. That guy is not Anthony Nelson. That guy is not Joe Tryon Choinka. Choinka has the speed, mm -hmm. but doesn't have the physicality. He's more of a finesse player. Mo Camara has the speed and explosiveness plus the physicality. He is more like Shaq Barrett. He is more like Marquis Watts. And, and, and also, too, he's got some of the savviness that Jose Ramirez has. Ramirez is a very agile player, very instinctive player like Shaq Barrett was in terms of being able to play that chess match and, and read how an offensive lineman is setting and then taking advantage of that. Is he, is he setting too much with his kick step? Then you, you go inside, maybe with the spin move or maybe with the ghost move. Um, you know, is, is he is – he, setting too far back in this pass set you use a long arm a bull rush a push pull this guy's got a great arsenal and, and of weapons in terms of his pass rush ability really got to the quarterback matt i don't know if you have the stats but i mean he he really got after uh quarterbacks and he ran a four five seven which is actually faster 
than what Shaq ran uh, when he was coming out of Colorado State. So this guy probably a better athlete, 29 and a half sacks, 45 yeah. and a half tackles for loss. He can get it done. Uh, yeah, career high 13 sacks um, last season as well. I actually got to talk to him at the NFL Combine when we were in Indianapolis uh, earlier last month, and he wasn't up at one of the big podiums either. For those yeah. that don't know the the layout of the Combine, there's like six or seven like big stages where you'll see the Brock Bowers and Caleb Williams and all those guys speak. Yeah. But then there's a couple of side tables for lack of a better term, the the lesser known players. Mm-hmm. And I always feel, I always feel bad for those guys when they're over yeah. there. Um, but Kamara was one of those guys over there. And I'm just getting to talk to him in a little bit more of like an intimate setting again, because there's not as many people. You can kind of get a little more questions in. He is a guy that has true blue confidence um, mm-hmm. in himself. And you can, there's some guys you can feel that like aura or that, that sense of like, confidence but not cockiness and yeah Kamara was certainly that guy who I felt that way about and we've seen a lot of people in the chats of Peter people not just today but throughout draft season that have brought up Mo Kamara so he's yeah. caught your We're guys fans. attention yeah. as though. well he is well aware of Shaq Barrett um he said he doesn't exactly want to be Shaq Barrett because he's his own person which yeah. you'll hear a lot of players say that as well but they're like the only two guys in Colorado State history that or either breaking records or I believe got like all American or all conference or things of that nature. So he's well aware of like what Shaq Barrett was able to do in yeah. um, Tampa Bay. And he kind of wants to write a similar path to that as well. Um, undersized doesn't matter to him. The production is the, for all the production that we're worried about with Marshawn Nealon, he has it in droves. Now it's right. always the big question of, you know, the, the conference he's in and, and and how does that compare to the NFL level? But I don't know. I mean, we can say the same about a, a number of different guys in, in this draft. If if you have an ability to get after the quarterback, odds yeah. are that translate when you're, you're at least first yeah. getting to the I mean, NFL. Max Crosby, right? I mean, he came from a smaller conference and he's one yeah. of the best pass rushers exactly. in the NFL, you know? So it, it Sometimes the competition matters, you know, sometimes it doesn't. Jared Allen, right, came from Idaho State. Yeah. And and was a, a pass rushing terror in the NFL for years. So if you can get to the quarterback, you can get to the quarterback. Um, the thing is, the Buccaneers, they do like their young pass rushers, but you can never have enough. And and uh, you know, you had both of these guys, Neyland and and Mo Kamara, and they're completely different players, completely different sizes, makeups, and all that. Gives you a little bit of versatility. Remember, Joe Tryon Shawinka in the final year of his contract. Matt, you just wrote a story yesterday. An yeah. Interesting. It wasn't your idea, but you you kind of reimagined it and, and talked about Joe Tryon Shawinka maybe getting traded to Dallas. Right. That was a, a hypothetical trade that was proposed by what PFF uh, Bleacher Report. Bleacher Report. Bleacher Report. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to Dallas for a day three pick. You know, and and uh, uh, he's in the last year of his contract. They're not going to pick up his fifth year option. Anthony Nelson's in the last year of his contract. You've right. got a, a couple of young, unknown guys that they're excited about in Marquise Watts and Jose Ramirez, but you can't put all your eggs in their basket because they haven't done it yet. Um, exactly. And then you've got Yaya Diaby, who seven and a half sacks, good. Tackles for loss, good. Physical tools and traits, good. But the pass rush win rate of like 6.6 or 6.7, whatever it was, that's not good. I mean, Yaya's got to win one-on-ones. And to put that number in perspective, Joe Tryon Shoinka's pass rush win rate last year was, I want to say it was over 10. Shaq Barrett led the, the, the team in terms of starting caliber players with, with a 15 and a half. More, uh, Marquise Watts had a pass rush win rate of around 22% last year. And that very, very small sample size, but it just shows you his potential and what he can do. So, um, just to, to answer a question here again about the the methodology, and I get that, right? We, we, I've seen the name Chop Robinson here in the chat. I've seen uh, Chris Braswell, Adisa, Adisa Isaac, and again, we try to be realistic. We're not doing any trades in these drafts, and I don't know that Chop Robinson. A, he may not be there at twenty six. B, if he is there, the lack of production scares me a little bit. He reminds me of JTS. He's not a finisher around the quarterback. 
Uh, Disa Isaac was actually more of a sack guy, more of a tackle for loss guy, more of a finisher. And, uh, you know, Chop had the ability to get back there, but when he got back there, didn't always, you know, capture the prize, didn't always capture the flag. So having said that, you know, Braswell's probably going in the upper half of the second round. Same with Adisa Isaac. If they're there, then yeah, they're in consideration with, with Marshawn Nealon. But Nealon, I think, is probably a late second, early third round pick. That's why we, we tried to really stay true to the draft board, if you will. And who knows, maybe Kamara goes in the, the latter part of the third round and he doesn't make it to the fourth. Maybe that that happens, but that, that's some of the methodology there. Yeah, Adisa Isaac's in consideration. Braswell's in consideration. Yeah. Maybe Chop Robinson as well. But, you know, we, we tried to make it as realistic where this team is not getting everything and all of the star players that it wants because that's not how drafts are. You only have so many edge rushers and outside yeah. linebackers to draft um, in an NFL draft. And yeah. yeah, to your point about Yaya, he checked the boxes last year. He had a really good rookie season. Yeah. But now the tape is out on, on Yaya Diaby. Yeah. Uh, teams can prepare for him a lot better. Now, on the flip side, Yaya can take this offseason, get even stronger if that's possible, um, yeah. uh, work on pass rushing moves that he didn't necessarily use last season. So it is a game of chess between everybody else and Yaya, as it is for every single player. Um, but we can't just assume Yaya is going to go out and have another promising season right. like he did um, as a rookie. So, again, preparation yep. is key. And in a lot of these situations. It is. So the Buccaneers, uh, just to wrap up with Mo Camara, they go out to Colorado to get their pass rusher. Maybe you should go out to Colorado to get some advice. Um, well, actually, stay right here in Tampa because that's where Muni Financial is. At Amuni Financial, we help you live in the now. Thank you. Congratulations. You We're so happy Thank for you. you. Thank you. And even though the now may feel very different, you still need to plan for the future. How's your time in treating you? Oh, just fantastic. I know I say it all the time, but you really got to come up to Colorado. Let's do it. All right. Yeah. We can help you develop that plan to keep you on track so you can still prepare for tomorrow, today. Aim Uni Financial. Plan ahead. Stay ahead. Manage your family's wealth means more to Immuni Financial than simply allocating your assets. It means legacy planning, brokerage and advisory services, retirement accounts, college savings accounts, and insurance services. They've got over 40 years of experience. Why would you want to go anywhere else? Let Immuni Financial help you plan ahead and stay ahead. Give Immuni Financial a call at 1-800-868-6864 or visit them on the web at Immuni.com. I've got a large portion of my investments with Immuni Financial. Highly recommend it. Make sure that you call uh, that number, 1-800-868-6864, whether you're in Florida or across the state, uh, the United States of America. They can help you. Ask for Mark or ask for, for Dave and uh, and tell him that Scott Reynolds sent you. And um, make sure that you also, after you call him Muni, make sure that you stick around for tomorrow's show because we have uh, Greg Allman, our yep. good friend from Fox Sports. He is going to be on tomorrow's show at 4 o'clock. Do the Bucks still rule the NFC South? That's right. So we know the Falcons are the trendy pick right now, and nobody knows the entire NFC South better than than Tampa-based Greg Allman, who's always at one Buccaneer place as well. So he knows the Buccaneers. Bring your NFC South questions. He'll talk draft needs with the Falcons, with the Bucks, with the Saints, with the Panthers, as well as recap free agency for all those teams. And taking a look at some of those new coaches, Dave Canales in Carolina, as well as Atlanta's Raheem Morris. So that's tomorrow's show. And Thursday, well, let's stick with the Baker Mayfield theme here. Yep. Can Baker Mayfield do it again? NFL Films Greg Cosell is going to be joining us, talking about Baker Mayfield, the quarterbacks in this draft class, his thoughts on Kyle Trask, and Liam Cohen's offense with some X's and O's insight from Greg Cosell on Thursday. So, wow, what a fantastic week of Pewter Report podcast we've got going on this week, Matt. Yeah, it's an uh, awesome time of the NFL year. I mean, outside of actually games being played, uh, yeah. fantastic lineup this week, both with uh, the draft days that we've done on um, yesterday and today. And yeah. Should we tease something, too? I think we might have talked about it yesterday. Let's just go ahead and do it. Yeah, next Thursday it. show, next Thursday, friend of the program, former Pewter reporter, PFF's own Trevor Sikama is going to be on next Thursday. What is that? That's the 11th, April the 11th. 11th. So put it in your calendars. Yeah. It is a week from now, but 
you got something to look forward to. That's I know right. in the Bucks locker room, they would have a countdown, the, the days, hours, and minutes until their next game, which is typically right. every single Sunday. Feel free to do that with Trevor Sikamo. We know That's you right. guys love Trevor. We love Trevor. Um, tons of great memories working with him and obviously with him as one of the originators, really, of, of uh, at the time, what was the Pewter Nation podcast, which yep. is now the Pewter Report podcast. Uh, yeah, so always love having Trevor on and talking with them. We saw him at the the combine and had some chats with them, and looking forward to having him on next Thursday. That's right. He's going to be talking the Bucks first round draft strategy with Matt and I. So we're looking forward to that. That'll be a fun show as well. So uh, we've got a lot of great content coming up. A lot of it draft related. It's that time of year. Let's get back, shall we, to our. A mock draft here and finish up with some day three selections. Buccaneers don't have a fifth round pick, but they do have a sixth round pick and a seventh round pick. So they're going to go cornerback again. Jarius Monroe out of Tulane. This is a guy that I don't know if the Bucks like or not, but I like him. And he certainly checks a lot of the athletic boxes for the Buccaneers. Long physical cornerback helped Tulane these last two years. So much has been made about Michael Pratt, the quarterback, Ty J. Spears, the running back. Uh, this guy on the defensive side was really a catalyst for Tulane's rise into the top 20. And if you remember two years ago, they finished inside the top 10. They beat USC. It was a great comeback win. I believe it was the Cotton Bowl. And yes, w- it was going those... on during a podcast because I remember it, it had it on yeah. in the background. And yeah, uh, yeah. So Tulane come down and win at the end. Crazy fourth quarter comeback by the Green Wave. And Monroe actually had an interception of Caleb Williams in that game. Then his last interception didn't even come for the Tulane Green Wave. It came with his own team at the East-West Shrine Bowl, where he was one of the defensive MVPs. So this is a guy, great ball skills, three interceptions in each of his two seasons after transferring from Nickel State. Uh, just kind of a, of a, a dynamo in coverage. Gets a little too handsy and grabby. Probably has to get some better technique and get those penalties out of his game. That's fine. He's not a guy in in round six that you're going to draft to start. He'll play in special teams. But bring some cornerback depth as another young guy in case, you know, uh, Nate Wiggins is slow to develop or maybe you miss on Nate Wiggins. you got another guy that is in the mix that fits the traits that Todd Bowles wants. And remember, Bryce Hall, one-year deal. Tavier Thomas, one-year deal. Jamel Dean, we talked about being on the hot seat. So you might have to replace three cornerbacks next year. And if you draft Nate Wiggins in round one and Jarius Monroe in round six, you, you've got two for the future to pair with Zion McCollum. And it's a little bit of going the route of Zion McCollum when they drafted him in a later round draft pick. Now, Zion obviously came from a, a smaller school, as did, um, as did this player originally at Nichols before going to Tulane. To, to yeah. So, hey, if he takes the ball away, it's everything that we said before. They need turnovers. They need their corners to take the ball away. I'm all for uh, a late developmental pick and see what he can do. Yep. We're going to finish up our draft here in the seventh round. Um, The name scares me a little bit. I'm going to give it a go. Washington inside linebacker. Adufayan Olafosio. I I said it right the other day. Olafosio. There we go. Olafosio. Olafosio was uh, was a, a captain for Washington, was their middle linebacker, as uh, he was the, the kind of the counterpart to Michael Penix, helped this team go undefeated all the way up until the national championship game where they lost to Michigan. Tough, hard-nosed, athletic linebacker. We know that, that Jason Light likes those Washington Huskies. He's drafted a bunch of them. And the, the thing that I really like about Ofosio, oh, there you see him right there with Marshawn Nealon at the Senior Bowl. That's another oh, Senior man. Bowl box check right there, you know. <laughs> so the thing I like about this guy is is just the athleticism, more so than anything, because you're looking for a guy on day three that's special teams, re- you know, related. You're l- looking for a guy to get in there and cover kicks and all that. Plus, they need another body to replace Devin White. You, you already have K.J. Britt. He's going to be your starter next to Levante David. You have J.J. Russell in the hopper. You've got Servasi Dennis, who's going to put up a fight as well. But you want speed at inside linebacker in a Todd Bowles defense. This guy ran a four five six. He had a thirty nine point five inch vertical jump. Um, he had a, a nine five five RAS score, 
which ranks 121st out of 2,649 linebackers, according to Kent Lee Platt. 10 foot, 8 inch broad jump. He's not just an athlete, this guy can play some football. He's, he's had some injuries in his past, but played wire to wire last year, six foot, 236 pounds. He's well put together, but in his career, Matt, 251 tackles, 15 tackles for loss, seven sacks, eight pass breakups, five forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, and an interception. And I, like I said, really put together a senior season, 94 tackles, eight yeah. tackles for loss, really had uh, a, a good finish to his Washington Huskies career. And certainly ended up in the national championship game as well. Keeps the Washington pipeline going in Tampa, as is tradition. And, hey, let's remember, a couple seasons ago, the Bucs had a Mr. Irrelevant pick, went with Grant Stewart, who ended up being a really good good special teams player for them. Even got himself an Uber Eats commercial uh, out of it before they traded him to the Indianapolis Colts. I'm all for drafting another linebacker who's athletic, can play on special teams, and then, hey, throw him in the mix for a backup role at linebacker. I mean, we saw that back in the day with K.J. Britt. Now it looks like he's going to be starting next to Levante David this year after playing consistently last season. Anytime you get either a hard-nosed player, a physical guy, or an athletic player that just loves to play football, and I think when you see a guy making a tackle without his helmet on, he loves to play football. Um, it's never a bad thing to look for a guy such as him to Matt, help your team. He loves playing football just as much as Eric Gross loves helping you buy or sell your house, right? I mean, he is the official realtor of Pewter Report for a reason. Folks, you got to give Eric a call. 513-907-4271, the Eric Gross Group. Eric is is uh, our pro bowler, so make sure you draft this guy, sign him as a free agent, trade for him, whatever you want. Get him on your team. And go to the Houses in Florida website, housesinfla.com. It's a great website. You can check out the open houses. You can check out uh, all of the inventory Eric has. Um, knows the area like the back of his hand. He's a Tampa native. Huge, huge Tampa Bay fan. Big time Peter Report reader as well. Uh, v- visit the housesinfla.com website or give Eric a call, 513-907-4271. No matter where you are on your home ownership journey, you're going to feel welcome with the Eric Gross Group, the official realtor of Pewter Report. And after you check out the Eric Gross Group, make sure you head on over to pewterreport.com and all of our social media and follow us at Pewter Report on X, Facebook, and Instagram. And please like this video and subscribe to Pewter Report TV. We're trying to get to 14,000 followers by the NFL draft, which is coming up at the end of the month. And we cannot do it without your help. So, If you like the podcast, if you like the various reaction clips or opinions or clips from the podcast or things that we put up during different events and and uh, interviews and press conferences at the Bucks facility, please subscribe to Pewter Report TV. We got more content coming. There is video up today. There'll be more videos coming, whether they're podcast clips or other great things we get into. And of course, with the draft, we're going to have full breakdowns of every single player. Talk to every single player that gets drafted, too. So a lot of great things coming up on Pewter Report TV. So please like and subscribe. Leave a comment on this video as well after it ends. Takes two seconds to subscribe That's and right. hit that like button. Help Literally get just to 14,000 by the draft. Like, That's our goal. Bam. Like. Bam. Like. Takes two seconds. Then you can go back to listening to us. You can actually listen to us and like and subscribe all in one motion. So Please do that. Uh, would greatly appreciate it. And we greatly appreciate all of you, the Peter people, after another great episode. We're going to do it again tomorrow, talking about the NFC South with Greg Amon of Fox Sports. Very excited for what should be a fantastic episode on tomorrow's show at 4 p.m. So until then, for Scott Reynolds, I'm Matt Matera saying thanks, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you tomorrow for another edition of the Peter Report podcast. Out. Out.